Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I am going to go through and do a little bit of an analysis and explanation of the story, The Necklace. You should have already read it. I am not going to read it to you, but I would like to spend a few minutes explaining it. So let's just start off here with this first sentence, pretty big sentence. She was one of the, well, let's just start there. She, we don't know her name. It just throws out this pronoun here. So we're already at a little bit of a loss and that's okay. But we're going to figure out pretty qu quickly who it is and what it's about. She was one of those pretty charming young women who are born, as if by an error of fate, into a petty official's family. She had no dowry, no hopes, not the slightest chance of being appreciated, understood, loved, and married by a rich and distinguished man. So she slipped into marriage with a minor civil servant at the Ministry of Education. So just in this first paragraph alone, we learn that she's pretty and she's charming. And it seems as if she should be in a very wealthy and important family because of her beauty and because of her characteristics. Unfortunately, she was born into a petty, small, not very rich family. We might call them middle class or perhaps lower middle class. And so she slipped into marriage. Look at that verb slipped. Think about that when you get married. Most of us want to make that choice and we're excited for it. Here she slipped. It's almost like, whoops, look at this accident. She slipped into marriage with a minor civil servant. She felt like she should have been in a rich, fancy family. Instead, she is in a uh, a relationship with a man who's in a small-time job, middle class. Unable to afford jewelry, she dressed simply. So, talking about the necklace here, which is the title, and unable to afford jewelry, she just didn't have it. Um, and so she suffered constantly feeling that all the attributes of a gracious life should have been hers. So we get the sense that she was kind of arrogant and selfish. She felt like she deserved riches. She deserved fame. She deserved special treatment. Instead, she didn't have any of that. She suffered because of it. Instead, she had shabby walls, old worn furniture, the furniture, the upholstery, that's the, the, the covering, the cloth and such. Uh, old, dingy, not very happy. And these things caused her pain. Well, you know what? Those are superficial, materialistic things. This woman, she is beautiful, charming, and superficial. All she cares about are really simple materialistic things. She dreamt of these fancy rooms and these people serving her and all of these beautiful crystal knickknacks. And yet, what does she get? An old worn down home. When she sat down at her dinner table with the three day old cloth, meaning it hadn't been laundered or washed for a couple of days. And her husband sits down and looks at the soup and he exclaims delighted, ah, oh, a good homemade beef stew. There's nothing better. We get this contrast, this comparison between her attitude and her husband's attitude. And her husband is delighted. And he says, oh, look, stew. Instead, she imagines these beautiful dinners, fancy parties. So she is unimpressed with the stew. And her husband's like, oh, nice. And he seems perfectly pleasant and perfectly happy. She had no proper wardrobe, no jewels, nothing. And yet she felt she was made for them. So we're again, we're just getting example after example after example. What kind of woman is she? Superficial. She just thinks she deserves riches, wealth, jewelry, fancy parties, fancy home. And yet she has none of that. She would have loved to be envied and admired and sought after. She wants other people to think she's special and to come to her. 
she had a rich friend from back when they were school. Uh, they used to be friends. But her friend, she didn't like visiting her friend anymore because it just made her miserable when she come home, came home. All right. Now, one day, her husband comes home and goes, look, look, I have something for you. It's an invitation for Monsieur and Madame Lucel to a fancy party. You would think this woman, who is all superficial, would be excited about this, right? Her husband seems excited for her. And instead she goes, oh, what do you expect me to do with that? He says, I thought you would be pleased. You never go out and this would be a, a good occasion for you. And all the officials will be there, fancy people, important people. And what's her response? I have nothing to wear. I don't have a proper dress. I don't have anything to make myself look fancy. And so he says, well, what about that thing that you wear to the theater? Now, you might be thinking movie theater. It would have been people acting on stage when this was written. But his point is, you have a dress. Why don't we go out? You wear it. It's lovely. And she goes, oh, no, that old thing. She's actually like crying. That dress, I can't go to this party. And so listen to what he says. He says, listen, Matilda. So we learn her name. I don't remember if this is the first time or what, but her name is Matilda. Listen, Matilda, how much would an evening dress cost you? One that you could wear again. Think about a wedding dress. Women don't ever wear wedding dresses again. Prom dresses, they never get worn again. Women spend thousands of dollars on these dresses and they wear them one time. And he's like, well, okay, let's be realistic. If you bought a fancy dress that you could wear again for other occasions, how much would that cost? And she thinks, I love this sentence, making her calculations at the same time estimating how much she could ask for without getting an immediate refusal. It's like when you talk to your dad and they say, you want some money for Friday night and go, dad, can I have 200 bucks? Dad's going to be like, are you crazy? Get out of here. No way. And if you ask for $5 and dad goes, sure, here's five bucks. And you're like, oh, I could have gotten more. You have to make that decision. How much is too much? So she's like, mm, how much should I ask for? And she goes, well, it's hard to say, but I could maybe get by with 400 francs. Now, a franc would be the French version of a dollar. So if we ignore inflation and all that, we're talking about $400 here. He goes a little pale. That was the exact amount of money he had set aside to buy a rifle so he could go hunting with his friends. Now think about this. This is a man who saved his money because he was going to buy this rifle so he could go out with his friends. And she says the exact money he has saved and put aside. And he goes, okay then, I'll give you the money. What does that tell you about him? What kind of man is he? I see a very good man, a man who loves his wife. How do I know? He's excited about the soup. He gives her the money she asks. He sacrifices his own happiness, the gun, and the hunting trip, so that she could buy this dress. He is a good man. You compare that with her selfish attitude so far. All right, but the, the, the party gets closer, and she's very upset. And she says, I have nothing to go with my fancy dress. I have no jewelry. And he says, well, why don't you wear some flowers? Those are perfectly fancy. And she goes, oh, no, that would just make me look poor. I don't want flowers. And then her husband, not giving up, not being depressed, not being upset, he says, wait, why don't you go ask your friend for her to lend you some jewelry? This is the rich friend from when they were in school. All right, I think I'm going to pause there and we're going to come back a little bit later to finish the story up. But this is uh, the necklace analysis part one.